All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Defining and Impacting High Risk and Extreme Stores. Uh, it's January, right? So hopefully everyone had a wonderful holiday, and we're, we've taken inventory. Inventory's over. Now what do we do? Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about with our great panel here today. So thanks for joining us. Um, with me today is my partner in retail crime, Jack Britton. Jack, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Warming up a little bit. Thanks, Kevin. Hey, everyone. Yeah, you look like you're thawing out in the background there. We're working on it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. We're we're excited to have you with us today. Um, we've got a, a, a few things to uh, to kick off with before we get started. There we go. We're going to start with our sponsors. Um, you know, as usual, just asking everybody to show the, the uh, sponsors a little love. Um, without these folks, you know, we just wouldn't be able to bring you these sessions like we do today. So uh, we appreciate them and we appreciate you supporting them. Uh, and our sponsors today, uh, Genetech, Cap Index, LVT, and Salient. And uh, I'm going to tell you just a quick little bit more about them just right now. So let's start with Genetech. Genetech Inc. is a te technology company with a portfolio that encompasses security, intelligence, and operations. The company's flagship product, Genetech Security Center, is a Physical security platform that unifies IP-based video surveillance, access control, automatic license plate recognition, ALPR, uh, communications, and analytics. For more information about Genetech, please visit them at www.genetech.com. -E -E Next up, we have LiveView Technologies. LiveView Technology is helping retailers deter crime, keeping bad actors out of the store and off the lot. Our mobile live units automatically detect and respond to unwanted behavior, alerting you to what's happening and allowing you to intervene before things get out of hand. In a community-wide deployment in two states, LVT units helped reduce violent incidents by 33% during Black Friday weekend. And a major home improvement retailer experienced a 40% decrease in unwanted behavior reported by customers and a 34% drop in unwanted behavior experienced by employees. It's time to be proactive about crime. Let's visit LVT at LVT.com to learn more. Next up is Cap Index. Cap Index is the pioneer and industry leader in crime risk forecasting. For over 35 years, Cap has worked with over 80% of Fortune 100, including 23 of the top 25 retailers, to assist them in mitigating crime and loss at their locations and out in the field. Visit them at www.capindex.com. And lastly is Salient Systems, but I'm not gonna tell you about Salium. I'm gonna let Keith do that. Hello, this is Keith Obley, Chief Security Officer for Salient. When I was running the loss prevention organization for Walmart and later the Home Depot, the challenge was making sure that we had actionable information at our fingertips to make critical decisions. Using Salient's open video management solution platform, you have that very opportunity today. Contact us at Salient Systems or me personally at keith.obley at salientsys.com. Thanks and enjoy the webinar. Thank you, Keith. And a very big thank you to our education partner, Loss Prevention Foundation. Uh, check out the Lost Prevention Foundation at lostpreventionfoundation.org. Uh, lots of great stuff happening over there. We've got some uh, some new content coming out too, which is great. We've got some uh, opportunities for you guys to earn your CEU credits by participating in today's webinar. So you get three CEU credits for today's session. So make sure you keep track of that if you are LPQ or LPC certified. And if you're not certified, well, why the heck not? Uh, reach out to the Lost Prevention Foundation today and learn a little bit more about getting certified today. And if you pull out your smartphones really quick, if you're not already subscribed to Loss Prevention Magazine, get those smartphones out, scan that QR code. If you're not fast enough to do it now, I'm going to show it to you again at the end. Um, but if you subscribe, it's free today. And uh, for those of you who join our webinars a lot, you'll notice that we always say that it's free. And that's because it's always free. It's free, 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 free. Uh, all the uh, advertisers pay for that. We can have it shipped to your home. We can have it shipped to your office. Uh, so subscribe today, get the print magazine, get signed up on the digital magazine. Uh, and again, if you don't already have Lost Mention Magazine, why the heck not? 
Uh, and for those of you who are tied into our ORC audience, um, just a quick plug for our uh, ORC recognizing retail theft and uh, ORC course that we have. Uh, we have scholarships for your law enforcement partners that are available. So uh, please, if you are with the law enforcement groups that uh, join our webinars, or if you are working with the ORC teams and you'd like to get some scholarships for the law enforcement folks in your community that you work with, please do reach out and let me know. We've got those scholarships available and we are happy to make them available to you and through you to your law enforcement partners. All right, that's enough out of me. I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Britton. Jack's gonna introduce our excellent panel for today. Jack? Yes, uh, I don't know that uh, most uh, don't already know our esteemed speakers today but we're going to introduce you anyway. Uh, David Lund is currently the Vice President of Loss Prevention at Dick's Sporting Goods. David, tell us a little, a little bit more about yourself for those that don't know you as well. So thanks, Jack. Yeah, I've had the privilege of leading the loss prevention function here at Dick's Sporting Goods for almost 18 years, uh, spending more than half of my career here. And uh, I gotta say, I've had uh, the opportunity to work some, for some pretty cool companies and some pretty cool places, but I'd say nothing beats Pittsburgh or Sporting Goods Retail. You go and and uh david you still running marathons too so it's funny that you ask kevin uh i i took a break i thought i was gonna stop uh but uh, looks like i'll be running one in april so oh, yes i guess i still am oh they pull you back in Good it'll be you. number 20 so i figured how can i stop at 19 yeah exactly yeah i gotta do a round number you gotta <laughs> do a round number. that's awesome Thanks. excellent well us browns fans are gonna bite our tongues through that that whole part of the conversation but uh, anyway, you're up first. Let's let's talk. Let's right start. With, let's start with David. Here we go. Cool. So uh, let's hit the next slide right away. So uh, we did just wrap up in inventory, as Kevin mentioned. You know, inventory is over, and, and what's next? But uh, that won't be the only cycle for us in 2024. Uh, this year, we're going to be dividing our annual physical inventories into four groups, and we'll be conducting those counts quarterly. So. Those counts, along with our weekly cycle counting, are going to give us a regular monitoring of shrink trends in our stores all year long. So something new for us. Uh, we usually were counting uh, toward the fall, uh, the total company, but now we'll be counting a little bite at a time every quarter to keep us uh, to keep us aware of what, what the trends are uh, across the company. Uh, next slide, please. Um, that inventory performance, um, along with uh, with what I'll call incident count, incident type, the severity of those incidents. They all help us classify our stores into one of four risk grades. Um, and we typically look at data over a three-year period. Um, our attention is really focused on our risk tier three and risk tier four stores. That's our high risk and very high risk stores. And uh, we certainly recognize that there's a difference between protecting stuff and protecting people. And of course, people are our priority. And the incidents are something that we really can consider very carefully. Um, and what kind of incidents are happening in our stores, even though the losses might not be that severe, some of those incidents might be. Um, and of course, nothing's absolute. We look at all circumstances on a case-by-case -case basis, but th that's not the only thing we use. Next slide, please. We, we also inform our decisions on independent crime data. So this is really helpful when we're determining um, the opening protection standards for a new location. Um, and we certainly, of course, know what's happening in our existing stores, but oftentimes, that immediate retail node is not known to us. Um, and we definitely don't have visibility to the greater community um, necessarily, especially as we see incident trends developing in our own stores and we wanna figure out like what's happening. So we'll look at FBI crime data trends and we'll also leverage services like CAP Index to coordinate uh, and contribute to our decision-making. But again, nothing's absolute. We look at all kinds of circumstances on a case-by-case -case basis. And sometimes that means getting on the ground. Next slide. In my opinion, I tell you, our real estate team is second to none. Like they pick really great sites for our stores. Uh, but regardless, we still do local site surveys to determine any special needs that we might have to put in place to create a, a uh, safe and profitable environment, uh, especially for those new stores where we're, we're really not aware. Uh, but we also do this for existing stores, especially when we have to make a case to invest in resources. Um, again, based on local trends, what we're seeing in our store, if we wanna invest more, uh, sometimes we'll go and check out the area, right? So um, over the course of a long-term lease period, circumstances in a retail area can change pretty dramatically. So we'll go to that site, um, usually driven by some kind of trend awareness. 
Um, we'll look at adjacent retailers and generally we'll look at what strategies they're deploying. So, you know, why reinvent things when it's happening there? You can get a better idea of what others are doing and using um, and help us understand really what also might be impacting the trends that we're seeing. Um, our our uh, practices that are being deployed at some other retailers pushing uh, criminals to our space uh, because we don't have the same level of protection. Are we the path of least resistance, if you will? And, and of course, we're looking for things like mobile security deployments, uh, security officers, off-duty police, um, special or extreme merchandise protection strategies, things of that nature to help inform us about what we might be doing or should be doing in our location. This slide here kind of represents um, what a site survey might reveal uh, in relation to a space adjacent to one of our existing stores. Next slide, please. Depending on you know, what our expected or actual experience is at our location, uh, we're probably going to consider additional layers of protection. So uh, just having a, an incident number or a shrink number, like that's not enough to really inform a holistic decision. So we do have what I'll call basic merchandise exposure standards. That's our, our tagging and protection requirements that are basic for all stores. Those are our base standards that everybody follows. Um, we review and recalibrate those at least once a year and depending on the category, um, we often look at the standards based on what the category might be, uh, brands inside of that category, some are more popular than others, um, and then price points also inside of those brands, uh, because you just can't protect it all. So we have to be pretty strate strategic and surgical about it. Now we adjust those standards based on the trends that we're experiencing, and uh, and sometimes for inflation, uh, minimum price points for protection could increase as prices in a category go up. And again, because you can't protect it all. Um, in addition to our basic protection standards, stores can also apply for what we call exceptions. Um, and they'll do that to protect a, a product or a category that they're actually having a problem with. Um, so, you know, one sport, I'll use lacrosse as an example, might be more popular in, uh, in, the, in Maryland or in New York. Uh, and that, that product might be more at risk there than it might be in Denver or Omaha. So we might have an exception for that kind of product there. That is a rigorous process, though, I'll tell you. Um, beyond, you know, kind of the impact to our customer and the business, we consider the cost of protection overall, the tags or devices that we need to use, the labor to apply or remove those tags, um, or functions that uh, uh, might, might determine um, some type of uh, assistance that's necessary. So if we're going to protect something in a way that's going to require a teammate uh, to help out. All of these exceptions typically have expiration dates uh, that cause us to re revisit them more often. Um, to see if they're still necessary. And primarily this is because we put these protections in place for products that, that might be hot now, um, but after some time they might not be having, have the same kind of risk. But we're always working with our operations and merchant partners uh, to carefully test and reduce uh, tagging whenever we can, um, as long as we can satisfy uh, the needs of the business and our customers. You know, we wanna reduce as much friction as we possibly can. Um, the merchandise protection by itself, though, is rarely the only solution uh, that we deploy to our highest risk stores. We usually have a, a layering approach uh, that also includes uh, security and surveillance tools, tools uh, uh, like, a, like an LVT tower um, or uh, building perimeter protection. Uh, we might use gates uh, to dissuade burglaries um, or other activity. Um, we might contract security personnel or off-duty police officers. Uh, and in the most extreme circumstances, we might actually relocate entire departments of merchandise to a different part of the store that makes some of those more brazen thefts that we all see a little bit more difficult, difficult to execute. So we also have seen a good amount of success uh, when we're staffing um, in areas very strategically and surgically um, dedicated to a brand shop or a category where there's a, a much more intimate contact with that customer, um, but much better engagement and execution. Uh, and the departments look great too. Uh, so uh, that's a win-win for everybody. Um, I'll, but I'll say, you know, we really haven't reinvented the wheel here. Uh, we look at most things on a case-by-case -case basis, um, but, but uh, that layering approach uh, is typically what's most successful for us. It starts with a basic merchandise exposure standard, those exceptions that get layered on top, and then whatever other um, means we need to deploy depending on how risky the area is. And that's it. We'll go to the next slide. There's my contact information. Um, I'd really uh, be happy to uh, uh, share more one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Uh, feel free to reach out if you have any questions about our strategy. And I'd also love to learn more about what you're doing. Because uh, as I mentioned, you know, copying one another is some of the best ways we could be successful. Excellent. Thank you, Dave. And that's, and that's a big reason why we're doing today's session, right, is 
to kind of get that perspective about, um, you know, what is, what, what are we doing out there? Right. Um, what are some of those best practices and what are some of the things that, you know, maybe we weren't necessarily thinking about um, and or reinforcing some of those best practices as a, as a shared, um, as a shared best practice and industry best practice. Right. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that you mentioned about, you know, kind of going into an area and seeing what other people are doing, you know, looking at the security countermeasures that are already in place um, it's that, that networking in these neighborhoods that we're in is critical, right? Um, and it's important to be uh, associated with the other people, the other retailers in your area, with the law enforcement in your area. Um, and you know, the, you're going to learn off of each other, you know, what, what they're, what's happening to them. Um, so you can better protect yourself too. So it's not just getting pushed down the street, like you said. So um, sure we'll talk a little bit more about that, um, as we come out yeah. of this and into kind of the panel discussion. So, um, thanks for the overview there. Um, uh, Jack. Let's uh, let's introduce Dave. Okay. Uh, next up is Dave Rogers. Dave is currently the senior director of market asset protection leadership at Macy's. He's responsible for Macy's store loss prevention strategies, leadership, and the day-to-day -day execution of loss prevention slash asset protection programs. David, welcome. Hello, Hello everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, I've been with the company 28 years. Uh, I started off just as a detective, worked my way up through various different assignments. Uh, majority of it was in asset protection, but I also spent some time in operations, also in a combo role as well, where I learned a lot and how it can make an impact. So trying to get a little touch of every different dif discipline within asset protection, including investigations. I'm very into systems and innovation. That's where my wheelhouse is, and I'll help share some of how we look at shortage at Macy's, some of the tools that we use. It's a little bit different for us right now is that we're still reconciling our inventory. So we're learning a lot and understanding what's theft and what is process related and how can we inventory our goods in a much more efficient and accurate way. And we're certainly making some transitions that I'll share as well. Excellent. Well, thanks David for being here with us today. And um, there's something that you don't hear very often anymore is someone saying, I've been with the company for 28 years. Um, that's like ridiculously impressive. So congratulations on that, on that milestone. Thank you. Thank just, you. you know, Thank hear you. that a lot. Uh, and that um, I'm sure you've seen quite a bit over those 20, uh, 28 years for sure. So um, we're looking forward to hearing a little bit more about, um, you know, how you guys dissect uh, inventory results and shrink and, and make your impact on, on your uh, high shrink stores. So uh, take it away. Great, thanks, Kevin. There's our uh, downtown 34th Street store, Herald Square. Um, that's where the biggest store in the world is. And I would encourage anybody to come visit it if you ever get a chance in the New York City area. Welcome to have you, give me a shout out. I can help, actually help you meet with some people, maybe show you a couple things too. We have a very impressive operation in our Herald Square store. We'll go ahead and get into the next uh, slide. So talk a little bit about our inventory process. We got really heavy into the RFID space back in 2011 from just having some pilots to proof of concept to rolling it out across the entire portfolio. And um, the majority of our goods have RFID on them and we're making transitions from barcode traditional scans into RFID for financial results. And that gives us a lot of benefits and I'll get into that from an AP lens for uh, in a second, but from an operational standpoint, it really can increase our efficiency uh, during the take to be able to walk through and to be able to fan out merchandise and record all of our inventory has a lot of efficiency and a lot of upside for us. Um, it also allows us to see our inventory at a more regular basis. So our monthly cycle counts are extremely um, important for us for a variety of reasons. The number one reason why we got into RFID was to drive sales for our replenishment businesses, to make sure that we have the right goods, right styles, colors uh, with our merchandise and verify that so we can best assort our customer. Um, and then there's a lot of expense savings. If you're able to find the product throughout our store, whether it's from an asset protection standpoint, fulfillment, um, or inventory, it allows us to save a lot of expense once you have a fully fledged RFID ecosystem within your stores. Um, we innovate. So when you make a transition from barcode to RFID, there's a lot of learnings in between. And I can tell you, we had an innovation that came really close to the beginning of our inventory, which was a scan tool. And we were able to understand how you could take a bring your own device eligible colleague, have their 
own device, scan an item, any of our millions of SKUs to tell you whether it's being inventoried and what mode it's being inventoried um, and what day specific to the store. So it, it is, allows us to get better accuracy on making sure that we capture every unit on the day it's supposed to be inventoried as well as the mode it's supposed to be. Once we get our results, we made a lot of innovation in regards to reconciliation. So we're able to pull in all of our inventory results, again, into a bring your own device friendly environment. And we're able to get down to the UPC level. So if I'm standing in a store and I'm looking at a rack of merchandise, or I'm looking through my inventory results, we have built in logic and algorithms that allow us to say, hey, this is where you're specifically most likely going to be missing your merchandise. Let's go walk out to the pad. And while you're on your device, you're able to get down to the UPC level and the quantity that's missing and getting into the why. And to be able to understand, when did I last receive this merchandise? How do I go ahead and submit a submission for a reconciliation? How do we clean up the number as best as we possibly can to reduce the shrink and have an accurate inventory and assortment for our customer? A lot of innovation based upon hearing from our stores and some of the pain points. And just as we continue the journey from switching in from a barcode to an RFID uh, environment for our inventories. We'll go ahead and go to the next slide. We got some very basic fundamentals here on the left-hand side. Not, nothing new, as David mentioned earlier. Rate versus last year. How are our financial inventories looking at rate versus last year? What do our new vendors, since they don't have a history with us, what do those trends look like and how do we forecast and be proactive about future trends with these new vendors so we can protect them uh, from a profit standpoint? Our monthly RFID cycle counts, that makes us a little bit different in the industry. We take a monthly cycle count every single month for the majority, overwhelming majority of our SKUs that are tied to RFID. And we're able to understand our shortages every single month. We're able to go down to the SKU level, just like during our annual inventory, we're able to click on a link that takes us right to the picture of the merchandise so we know exactly what we're missing and we can understand where it's positioned on the floor so we can get in the way of theft trends. We don't have to wait six months. We don't have to wait for quarters. We don't have to wait for a full year. We have a, a report card every single month of how we're doing so we can monitor the trends and monitor the impact of our actions that are having on an annual basis as well. Um, productivity from an internal, external, uh, and store recovery uh, scenario. We look at all of those spikes in, by different markets and different reporting tools that we have available to us to understand, hmm, where are we running hot and where should we make some investments? Similar to David, uh, in regards to tier incidents, we have three at Macy's, and we look at the severity, the complexity, the quantity that we have, as well as how they're clustered across our store's enterprise. And then from an audit perspective, you know, a lot of our shortage can be caused from operational uh, means, also from other, other external and internal uh, scenarios. We have our in-store audits that are done by our colleagues. We're understanding what those results look like. And then we have the shortage controllers that layer in and they look at all the different facets of our audit program, as well as how we're operating. It's really gauging a store's health, the pulse of the store and how they're doing, because if they're not operating in a clean way, we certainly aren't gonna be able to protect our merchandise from a, a minimum protection standards standpoint. And we're certainly not gonna be able to inventory it accurately if we're not organized and hitting on all cylinders. So that really gauges the health of our store so we can understand, hey, look, do we need some extra support in this specific uh, division or specific store so we can help mitigate it as we go through the year? Then we go through different store classifications in regards to target stores, monthly stores, as well as quarterly stores based upon our shortage results, as well as some of our other apprehension metrics. And then we also have store risk ranking, uh, where we look at a variety of different metrics, uh, shortage results. Uh, we look at our apprehension metrics and our safety incidents, and we can have a violence index based upon what we see with our proprietary logarithm. This allows us to be able to understand where we need to invest and where we need to make sure that we are staying closer to uh, throughout our uh, enterprise. We'll go ahead and go to the next slide. Here you can see that the stores fall into the center of our ecosystem, but we're all connected in various different ways. And we have to work as a team at Macy's. Um, our locations are the center of our universe. That's where our customer is. That's where our colleagues are um, delivering the results that we need on a daily basis. And the stores, um, similar to David's exception process, 
Um, we have exceptions that are part of the program. So every store tailors, we have our minimum protection standards. We have our minimum baseline for a shortage program that goes across our portfolio. But we also have stores ability to craft, use their creativity, their resources to improve processes, protection and placement of our goods to help reduce shortage. That is a part of the program for our highest shortage departments in every single store across our portfolio. So the plan and making sure it's executed, that is the store team's results um, that we look at. And we're able to monitor those throughout the year. And we'll be monitoring it through 24 through our RFID data and what that tells us. Are the actions working or do we need to pivot and make it stronger? We also are understanding how some of our technology investments are, are performing. With RFID in regards to our cycle counts and our financial inventories, we also have our stores that have smart exit technology to understand exactly what merchandise is going out unpaid for or what type of issues that we're having from a trend perspective, what stores have a high without sale rate. Those are things that we look at at the stores and see how we're performing and how it marries up to our shortage results. And then really just hearing the feedback and pain points from our stores on what the store needs what they're seeing and what type of solves that we can have from an investment standpoint, training program standpoint to help improve those stores. The region will look at talent across the board for where they have uh, talent that can move from within the region or through throughout the company. We look at our shortage programs based upon where uh, uh, unit levels that we have, whether it's a division or a region, to understand where we're performing. And then shortage presentations where we hold our stores and divisions accountable for the results that they have, make sure they're getting all the coaching, all of the resources, and all of the brainstorming we need to help win in total Macy's. And then the division, you know, understanding how we are uh, developing our talent on a day-to-day -day basis, making sure that we continue to get better every day. And then we have succession plans. We have a plan for every colleague for growth in our company, and we've demonstrated that year after year. But we have division specific strategies. We want people's creativity. We want our partnerships. We want to be able to tailor it where we're having a specific issue of uh, shortage related to a particular department so we can attack it and, and attack it in a different way versus having to legislate something across the company. We encourage that here at Macy's. And then we have our central leadership. Once we have all of this feedback, Lining with our senior management so they understand where our pain points, where our focus is for this year, making sure our merchants understand what we can do from a merchandise protection standpoint, making sure that they're on board to help protect their margins is extremely important. Understand where our investigative focus is, where our hotspots are from an ORC standpoint, what we're seeing from an internal dishonest colleague standpoint, where are, where are opportunities in supply chain, because we're all connected when it comes to shortage, understanding what opportunities and technologies that we need and focus that we have across our supply chain portfolio before the merchandise even gets to our stores. And then understanding what infusions and adjustments of staff and resources are needed across our portfolio to make us stronger and tailor it where we're most efficient to get the biggest return on investment. Um, we just had over, we have hundreds of positions that were added just recently all the way from the hourly to the senior director level here at Macy's. We encourage everybody to explore those opportunities on macysjobs.com. And I look forward to speaking with you more in the future. Excellent, thank you, David. Um, and good plug there at the end too. Uh, How about that? <laughs> for recruiting, well done. <laughs> There's a guy who's been there for 28 years, good job. <clears throat> now that was great. Um, and we've got a handful of um, questions and answers and things uh, that we're going to want to look into. Um, a few of the things that you said, I'm going to I'm going to open it up as part of the panel, though, as we get there. So if you do have questions for uh, for David, please do put them in the Q&A, but we're going to get to the Q&A piece um, after this. Um, so thank you again for that. And uh, it looks like um, batting cleanup here on the presentation side of this will be Chris Harris. Jack, you want to introduce Chris? It is. Next up is our good friend, Chris Harris. Uh, he is currently the Director of Asset Protection and Safety for the Kroger Company, where he's responsible for managing the shrink and safety operations, operations. in the retail stores the retail as well, stores as, well as, as the supply well chain. The supply chain. Chris, thanks Chris, for being here with thanks us. For being here with us. Hey, thank you, Jack. 
So I've only been with Kroger for two years. Um, I've been in the industry for uh, a little over 25 years and held a number of roles in safety, compliance, um, enterprise risk, and, and but most of it in loss prevention slash uh, asset protection. And yes, I, I oversee, uh, I'm not based out of our, our general office, the headquarters in Cincinnati, which is my background here. Um, we, in my role, I'm responsible for retail shrink and, and safety, as well as the supply chain program. And then kind of unique, I think, to what we do here at, at Kroger in asset protection, I'm, I'm also responsible for DSD operations and technology for the enterprise. Um, reclamation, uh, the reclamation process, uh, salvage sales, um, scam-based trading, uh, and a host of other things, but I think that's kind of unique to asset protection, but it all fits with our total loss model. Chief, Chief Cook and Bottle Chief Washer. Bottle. Yes, that too. <laughs> Got a little bit of everything in there. <clears throat> Trying to see where that echo is coming, coming, coming through. Not sure why. Not sure why. Are you guys hearing that? We are a little bit. All right. Well, let's uh, let's go ahead and kick it off to you then, um, Chris. Let's walk through your. Uh, you know, we 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 really were excited about having you involved in this because we wanted to see um, this. You know, the dynamics and the diversity between what we had. You know, we looked at specialty and sporting goods with David Lund. We looked at you know the big box and, and apparel concepts with um, with David Rogers. And now we're going to talk. Um, grocery, which which brings a whole different layer of um, of everything, right? I mean, you just listed out all the things that you're responsible for, right? Um, and just from that alone, uh, we've got a, uh, a, a an insight into some of the complexities that your world, you know, brings to the table, right? Um, we're not talking about you know inventory four times a year with David, um, monthly with David Riders, but you guys have to do stuff, you know, almost at least weekly, if not daily, right? Um, when it comes to perishables and things like that. So I'm really excited to hear how this process translates into into your world. Yeah, th thank you, Kevin. Uh, are you still getting the echo or is it is it fixed now? Sounds a little better now. I think we're, I think we might okay. be all right. Hopefully this will work. Good, good. Okay, do you have the slides, Jack? There we go. We go to the next one. All right, so here's our inventory process at Kroger, and it's it's fairly standard in the grocery industry. I've been in uh, different boxes from big box retail to specialty um, to department um, and now grocery. And we really have it in two buckets. We have a fresh inventory bucket, and that's everything which is produce, floral, meat, seafood, deli, bakery. Um, and those inventories we take every period um, and we use our own associates. Um, we do it at a commodity level uh, and we use a Zebra or TC52 device, um, kind of similar to the RF handhelds. Um, and for us, it's important to take those fresh inventories every period. Some companies will do it quarterly. We do it every period because when you have the turn of products like you do in fresh, um, you want to have that accurate inventory level. If you think about it, we really have grocery uh, in those fresh departments in a store for one to one and a half weeks, and then it completely turns. Through that, with all the spoilage for, for anything that, that falls on the floor, is dropped, goes out of code, um, all that gets scanned out. Um, so it is, a, it is a very manual process to, to keep up on that for an associate. So that's why we really like to do that each period and make sure that our fresh product inventory is, is where it needs to be, it's accurate, and our reorder replenishment system can keep up with it and make sure we're in stock for customers. From a uh, center Chris, I'm gonna, uh, Chris, I'm gonna interrupt Chris, you just for one second. I, one second. I seem to have, um, I think it's a problem, I don't know if it's your microphone or if there's anything electronic near your laptop or anything that might be giving a little bit of interference. Okay. Because you were you were spot on before, and we're we're getting just a little bit. Of, there's some kind of something coming through. Okay, hold on one second. Oh, that actually sounds way better already. It does. Yep. Just kind of moving my thing. Okay. Yep. Well, let's right. try it now. Sorry to interrupt. Let's try it again. Sorry about that. No problem at all. Oh, that's perfect. Um, so then, 
Okay, great. So then from the, let me know if it happens again. I'll, I'll, I'll move him further back. <laughs> um, from the center store inventory side, we're pretty standard. Um, so what you've already heard is, is kind of where we focus. So we'll do anywhere from, from a six month inventory to a 12 month inventory. Um, depending on uh, what our results in a particular store is. And, you know, for us, the, the most, we get a benefit in knowing what our shrink is when we do these inventories. But I think the most important part is the replenishment of the goods. If you have a store um, that has high shrink and high loss, then, then your shelves likely are, are going to be empty and your on hands are going to be low. Uh, and it's important to get that replenishment and get those sales, but also use that information uh, to build a strategy to ensure that you keep that product there for the customer. And our center store departments that that, uh, that we do uh, once to twice a year are grocery, uh, dairy and frozen, uh, general merchandise, health, beauty, cosmetics, and pharmacy. And we use a third party to do that. So we don't use our own associates or our own equipment. We use the third party and third party equipment. You can go to the next one, Jack. So really, you know, we, we, spend, we spend a lot of time on our pre-inventory, uh, which is, is not uncommon for any of us on, these, on this call. We do preparation actions, we do store visits, we make sure that uh, our stock rooms are organized, our product is organized, the shelves tag correctly. Um, so organization is key. We make sure staffing, uh, we have the appropriate staffing levels, not just from, from our side, but also from the, uh, the, the inventory service for those third party ones. And then post inventory, um, really we look at preliminary results. So as soon as we can get a prelim result, um, we're deep diving, we're analyzing, we're trying to understand where the loss is and was there a mistake uh, in getting in front of it. And then looking at our exceptions, deep diving our exceptions, um, doing a root cause analysis. Uh, and then of course, the, the final step is the actions for improvement. And next one, Jack. So I think more importantly to the process is how we how we go about determining uh, if we're going to have a problem uh, with with shrink in a store, uh, even before or without an inventory. And I wanted to line out some some key performance indicators um, that we have on both the fresh and the center store side. Um, some some are similar, some are the same, and, and some are vastly different. But from a fresh standpoint, uh, over delivery or ship versus sales. Um, is a key measurable that we look at. So when we start to see that we're shipping more to, than the stores are selling, uh, what's left we know is gonna be shrink. So that's a constant measurable that we're working with our stores on getting to the appropriate level for ordering. Sometimes it's unpredictable in the, in the retail side, we'll run an ad and we think it's gonna be a lot better ad and then we'll get a, a weather event and maybe it doesn't perform well, but we still have that product we have to sell or it's gonna go bad. So that's one of the trickiest things about fresh, but we monitor that over delivery a few times a week. Um, we look for inventory growth, which, which kind of goes hand in hand with that. Sell through is a big one for us too. So when we run uh, fresh promotions, we sell out distributions of products. So maybe you're around the holidays and, and you send a, a bunch of cakes out there, uh, holiday cakes. We're measuring on our end what we're sending out and what's selling and determining what's less left. So one of our big initiatives is to, to identify sell through uh, and make suggestions for improvement. So it's not uncommon for us to call a division up and, and a merchandising team to say, we need a better price on these cakes because you're, move, you're not moving them at a level that's going to sell them. So uh, we're very tied into how much of our product is selling on those, those key fresh uh, distributions. Um, we're looking at markdowns. Uh, we try to, we, we have a zero hunger, zero waste initiative here at Kroger. We don't want to throw anything away. So we'll mark it down if we can, so we don't have to throw it away. So we're constantly measuring markdowns. Uh, we're measuring products scanned out that didn't have a markdown because that shows we didn't find it and we didn't give it a chance to sell. Generally, if we mark down product, we'll have a close 80 to 90% sell through of that product. Um, so it shows that if we mark it down, it will sell. Um, so we have to give it the opportunity to sell. So that's one thing we measure. Of course, scan outs, cooler conditions are, are another one. Are we rotating our coolers? Are we doing a first in, first out? Are we dating those coolers? 
Um, and if we're seeing any of these opportunities, we know that this store uh, potentially is, is, is going to have a tough, uh, fresh inventory. And then I added warehouse day supply there. You know, if, you know, we, we look at everything, not just in the store, but what's in the warehouse. So uh, one term we use is days of supply, and that's how many days you can, you can supply your stores if your shipments stop. So I can say in, in general, we wanna go two days of supply of berries. If my warehouses grow beyond two days of supply of berries, uh, potentially we're gonna, we're gonna have uh, more loss because the berries are gonna to get to the store uh, and, and, and be you know, uh, lesser quality. So we, me we measure everything in fresh, specifically produce like that, berries, avocados, um, salad mix. And we, ne we have a set target on how many days we wanna we want it to be in the warehouse and then we work to achieve that. And then center store, I think most people are, uh, are pretty familiar with. Inventory growth is the, uh, the main indicator that we see uh, to tell you that you're gonna have a tough inventory. So we, we monitor inventory growth, uh, known loss scans, uh, on-hand inventory adjustments. Do we have folks zero, zeroing out product? Um, obviously that's an indicator of theft or an, an indicator that you didn't get a shipment of product. Um, what are your direct store delivery credits, your DSD credits? Um, you know, in grocery, uh, generally it's about 35% of your product comes in uh, from a vendor, a direct store delivery. Uh, Pepsi, Coke, Frito-Lay come to the back door and put the product out. Uh, certain percent of that um, you would expect to have a credit on, one and a half to two and a half percent. Um, essentially, you don't have any loss there of expired or damaged product because they'll credit you back. Um, but you, you need to manage that process and ensure that you're finding those credits and in, in, in that vendors issuing those credits. Reclamation credits too, that's uh, or when we scan it out of the back, back of the store, is it going to our reclamation center? Um, we are, as I said, a total loss model. So um, if it doesn't go through the register, it's our shrink. It doesn't matter if it's scanned out, doesn't matter if it's donated. It doesn't matter what you do with it. If it doesn't go through the register, it's our shrink. So we're accountable if, if pharmacy uh, orders, you know, too many vaccines and, and don't sell through it. Those vaccines become our shrink. Um, no matter what it is, it's our shrink if it doesn't go through the register. So we're very, very in touch with all those uh, programs and, and initiatives. And then uh, stockroom conditions, I think, is the same in Center Store uh, as it is in Fresh. If you walk into a disorganized stock room, you have disorganized on hand counts, you have pilferage, you have damages, and that's a key indicator of, of a high shrink. So, Jack? So, switching gears a little bit to our risk, uh, our risk model, um, the way we look at it is uh, we use a crime index score. Um, that's, that's the main driver, is we want to use analytics as a base and determining uh, what our risk levels are. Uh, and then some historical uh, company information such as shrink, uh, as well as the incidents that, that we're having in, in the locations. So really we use that to build our, our risk level. And, and I have four tiers on here. We do have a, we do have a max tier as well uh, between high and extreme, but uh, we recently have gone to the extreme uh, risk level and, and we call it extreme to separate it. And it's a very small group of our stores. Um, but and it is those stores that are in the toughest areas. So we really wanted to call them out and make sure we do things differently in those stores. And we also wanted to reclassify our, our shoplifters. I think uh, in the past we've had an amateur, uh, professional organized crime. We, th we, we found in the last two years, um, there's a piece of violence that needed to be added to that um, because the, it certainly is a factor to consider in, in how you use your resources um, to prevent lost, to prevent shoplifting, um, and to keep your associates and your customers safe. So for us, I'll just paraphrase it really quickly. The level one, they're your amateurs. Um, we see that as a low risk of violence and a low risk for shrink. Um, level two are more of your organized thieves that might be stealing online. Um, we think, or stealing and selling online. Um, we think that they could be a medium to high violence um, but their risk of shrink is very high because they take mass quantities. And our level three is really the, the newer one for us. And that's, that's um, 
those individuals that might have drug problems might be slightly unstable and pose a risk to our store, not just from a shoplifting standpoint, but they're going to get violent if somebody tries to stop them or confront them. Uh, so we felt that the risk of, of violence is extreme, but we think the shrink level was a medium. Um, so obviously you can, and these aren't, these aren't 100% all the time. You can't say everyone's in one of these group, uh, groups, but what we found is this has been pretty accurate for us to be able to speak to the organization on what type of shoplifter is, is essentially frequent, frequenting a particular store. Okay, Jack. And and this is uh, this is really my last slide, and, and this is what we're uh, what we're doing in some of our extreme stores. And there's there's been a lot of conversation about this in, in other conferences. And we felt that we needed to do things a little bit differently. And I know others others on this call are, are doing a similar thing. Um, so we've stepped up some of our uh, some of our solutions in, in these extreme stores. And, and I have a few pictures of our guards there and, and our extreme guard program uh, is really a, a big piece of it. And, and getting guards in your store uh, that can react, and these aren't police officers, these are, these are guards, um, but guards that we're giving some authority to act. Um, you know, we, we're, in some, we're in some areas, uh, Kroger is, that, that are, can be a little dangerous and, and you have an option out there. Uh, do you close and create uh, in, in, in the grocery industry what you call a food desert and folks can't get to groceries um, or, or do you adapt? Uh, and, and this is our attempt to adapt. Um, we said we're gonna make our stores safe for our customers and for our associates. And there's some risk involved in that when you start to equip guards uh, with the ability um, uh, you know, to, to, to handle situations, there is a risk. We thought the risk was greater to not do anything. Um, the risk, the risk to doing nothing outweighed the risk to, to equipping guards. Um, and then I've added some, some of our other solutions that we're using in stores. And some of them have, may have all of these. Um, some of them uh, may have, may have a handful, but we we have some really great solutions uh, on here that, that, you can use, and, and I'll just reference that, and I'll call out a couple of our sponsors with uh, Live View Towers and, and Cap Index who are on here. So I'm I'm not afraid to mention them since they are sponsoring this. But but great partners out there, and uh, certainly the technology and the asset protection community is some of the best in retail, um, and these solutions are, are are helping us get a handle on it. And we've seen improvement. Um, we've had customer. Uh, customer comments uh, from a positive standpoint. When you, when you start to put in uh, very secure measures, you worry how's your customer going to respond. If you pick the right stores uh, and you partner with your local government, um, you, you have a lot better chance of getting this through and seeing a success with it. All right, Jack, I think that's all I had. Sorry for the echoing. No, no, no. no. You're, you're totally fine, Chris. Uh, not sure what picked up there and um, uh, how that happened, but uh, we're, the rest of it was spot on. Um, let's let's you. just agree to blame it on Kevin and leave it there. Yeah, That's there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jack. Um, all right, so a um, couple things. So uh, we're going to ask the audience um, if you've got some questions. I know we've got a few in there in the Q and A because we definitely want to make sure we get to your questions um, and share them with the panelists. Um, I think there's a, a a lot for us to talk about based on the three presentations that we just had. I mean, we we see some similarities, we see some differences, we see some opportunities, right? Um, I think um, Chris, coming out of out of yours real quick, since we just ended on the whole extreme piece, um, uh, I'm curious as to sharing the the feedback that you guys are hearing from um, from the folks in those areas, right? I mean, there as you said, you've got um, stores in very difficult locations where it, it might just be easier to close up and and take your toys and go home right um, but you're sticking it out you're using these um, these different countermeasures what's the feedback from these communities uh, uh, you know I know that up here I live in New Hampshire um, you walk into a New Hampshire grocery store with uh, somebody you know armed guard at the door and and body armor and body cameras um, people would 
freak out, right? Um, but it's not that needed here, and they wouldn't even understand what that means. But in those neighborhoods, um, I gotta, I gotta think that that's a little more comforting than anything than scary, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, that's a great question, Kevin, because that that was our concern. <laughs> what is the community going to think of this? And uh, because we picked the right the right areas, um, not only were they accepting, they were appreciative. Um, and, and uh, you know, I was ab absolutely surprised at the number of comments that the managers in those buildings provided uh, to us that they received from customers that they appreciated somebody at that door. They appreciated. Um, uh, some of the other countermeasures we were doing, the towers in the parking lot, the very visual things that, that they were doing, they appreciated it. I mean, I think in those, in those stores, uh, the community knows that, that, the, that the area itself could be more dangerous. They, they know what the crime's like around there. They know what the other retailers are experiencing. So when you do something about it, I think, I think you're showing them that you care, and they become very appreciative of that work. Yeah, that's great. You know, uh, Chris, there's a lot that goes into that decision making process. I mean, uh, obviously, you're making a decision on on uh, things like you know what's going to be the customer's perception, you know, uh, the expense that goes into it. There's a, there's a lot that goes into that process before you determine. Okay, these are going to be the stores that we choose for this type of program. Can, can you talk about that a little bit? What goes into that decision process? Yeah, we um, well, we started with the data. <clears throat> so we started with crime statistics and, and uh, we wanted to have a base in data um, and we wanted to have a base in, in uh, from our, from, we wanted to have the opinion from our folks out in the field. So we wanted the operations side to the store managers, the, the, the district managers, the division managers. We wanted everybody to agree and kind of shake hands to say, yeah, this is a store that could use that and needs that. Um, so it was a it was a slow process from that standpoint, uh, but but worth it. And the other key to it, I think, Jack, that that helped the success is we partnered with the local government first. So lo local legislators, the mayor, um, the the police force, before we start to put these measures in place and make sure we have their support. Uh, and so when we had all the elements, the local leadership, the statistics and, and, and the government support within that area, then we knew we were in a pretty good spot to go ahead and put these in place. So um, I, we are in about we are doing it in about 26 locations today, um, but we are going to expand it in, in more locations. Now we have 2800 locations altogether, so we have a big chunk of stores, so um, that might just be a fraction, um, but but. You know, there's there's a ton of value in, in the stores that need it, and and to your point, in stores that don't need it, I would stay away. I would open that up to 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 David and David, um, right. as far as you know, when we look at these extreme stores, right? Um, are we, do you guys feel are you still looking at three categories, four categories? I don't know if we really got into the um, defining, you know, those and, and what are some of those opportunities that you're seeing in those stores that would be your, your absolute, you know, worst? Uh, I mean, obviously with, with grocery, um, you know, and pharmacy and things like that, you've got some staples, you know, people can't live without, right. Um, and, and you don't want to create, as Chris said, you know, a food desert, right. Um, but, you know, but do they necessarily need sporting goods, David, you know, do they, uh, you know, what, what about the, the, um, apparel piece? So, um, David Lund, let's let's just kind of give your thoughts there on that whole process. So so thanks, Kevin. First of all, we have to we have to acknowledge that sports change lives. So yeah, you got it. You got to have it. Um, it's a it's a big it's a huge piece uh, of our communities and uh, and our upbringings and uh, how we're formulated. So just that that's important. Um, but we're we're not dissimilar in our highest drinking stores, in our highest violent stores to Chris. Um, taking a page out of the Kroger book, uh, you know, when we learned about it at the LPRC and the, some of the extreme stores that they were dealing with. Um, we've gone to some similar tactics with um, what, what are, it's kind of with that more extreme uniform security officer and, uh, and a heavier deployment of off-duty police um, where necessary. And, um, and it's been, it's, it's worked uh, in those spaces, but I just has been mentioned, it's really important that you're cognizant of your community. You just can't plug that into you know, suburban, you know, Virginia, it just, it won't fit. 
um, it will look unusual and it, and it might be scary. But in some other places, as you mentioned, Kevin, it can be very comforting, actually. And you will get, as Chris mentioned, those thank yous. Like, I really appreciate you having that here so I can shop in peace. And uh, and so um, so we yeah so for our highest our highest risk stores uh, we will will deploy something like that in addition to live view technologies and other other technologies even inside the store more public view monitors um, and things like that to create an environment that actually feels safer um, in addition to creating a safer space. Excellent, David. I can tell you we have a similar philosophy. The only thing I would really add is is we have the voice of our colleague and our customer through various different mechanisms. So we have our net promoter score where our customers tell that they felt that they feel safe while shopping and understanding what those scores are and be able to stack rank them across our total company. And then we have our, our, our colleagues. Um, do they feel a commitment that Macy's has a, a commitment to safety and understanding those scores and how they blend together and what they're specifically telling us about the actions that we're taking. And are we seeing the improvement based upon the actions? So we use those as measurements, understand where we're at across our total company and to understand where we need to uh, adjust or continue to reinforce and promote. Now, um, Chris, I know that you've had some success um, in not only putting in these different security countermeasures, you know, as, as needed in certain areas, but in getting the vendor community to actually collaborate and work together um, in, in a lot of ways. And um, maybe we can, if, you know, would you can share on that as far as success there? And then David and David, I'd love to hear some perspective around what you guys have been able to do, you know, similarly, or maybe not yet, you know, but um, uh, in, in, not just putting a solution in, but putting a solution in that's a little more holistic because other piece, you know, all the pieces fit together, right? Um, Chris, you want to share on that a little bit? Yeah, we um, uh, we, we found that the, you take the value of each solution provider, uh, but then when working in concert, um, that, that value is times two, times three, times four, um, the magnitude increases. Um, and, and I'll give you like a for, for example, if you have uh, face matching technology and you have a, a gatekeeper or cart locking system, um, if you can get that cart to lock, send that signal to the, to the facial recognition, um, get an individual, get what they did by the cart locking, um, and then send a signal maybe to the parking lot towers to pick up that individual leaving the store, uh, maybe then sends a signal to a license plate reader. So now without, the, without having uh, necessarily boots on the ground, asset protection professional in that store watching that incident, without that, you've just now captured everything that occurred uh, and bundled it up uh, uh, for a prosecution. Now, uh, I think we all know uh, in, 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 the, in the prosecution uh, world today, it's a little more difficult. So you take a couple incidents and you use that technology and you build a pretty large case, you know, that, that the prosecution will take uh, based on those, the collaboration of those solution providers. And, and now you have a really winning solution uh, to addressing external theft in ORC. Excellent. And um, David, I know you learned a lot from, like you said, from the, from the LPRC, you've had a little experience with taking some of the vendors that I know Kroger has been working with um, and so forth. And um, are you, are you seeing some of that same success on your end? So, yeah, but just more independently operating. So we're not quite there yet uh, interconnecting those, but we certainly have learned the value of the layers. Uh, so whether it's a cart locking technology or LPR or cameras in the parking lot, or something to that, you know, we're, um, putting those things together for us is a little more, I'll say analog, if you will, you know, it's a little humans involved. Um, but uh, to Chris's point, the value of spending the time using those multiple tools and layers uh, to gather information and build a really nice case for detectives makes all the difference in, uh, in being able to prosecute cases. You know, what we're finding is, is they want to do this work there's just so much of it to do. It's hard to prioritize. And you can certainly get something to the top of the bin if you've got 90% of it done for them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Dave, I know you guys, uh, Macy's loves to innovate, right? So, um, you know, uh, tell us a little bit about how you're tackling some of these opportunities in those higher risk stores. Well, I can tell you um, our smart exit technology that we brought on with Tyco 
back in 2015 was a proof of concept where there was an idea and, and, and uh, we put it in three uh, different customer entrances in our suburban Maryland store to understand, is it possible? What will we get from it? And to be able to wash our sales versus our exits and how that marries up the serialized RFID tag paid a lot of dividends. We have it in over a hundred stores and we prioritize where we put those based upon those risk levels. You get a variety of different benefits from it. Um, to be able to understand what went out your store, by what quantities, by what department, and to be able to understand who with a couple of clicks is extremely valuable for us. Think about ORC stand uh, uh, situations where we have fences and we're able to understand the RFID, um, uh, how many RFID tags are with that fence and to be able to understand what stores they tie to and to be able to click and be able to see that potential suspect leaving on a prior date with that merchandise and to be able to connect all of the different dots with just a couple of clicks. That's where we've had a lot of different innovation and then some of our integration with some of our exception reporting from a colleague standpoint to be able to see what void activity, what merchandise left after it was voided and to be able to connect it with all these different innovations that we've had all based upon RFID over the last 10 years is extremely, um, makes our teams efficient and uh, more uh, targeted. Excellent. Okay. Uh, obviously, you guys know that I have a million questions, but we're going to go ahead and go to some of the uh, Q&A questions here next. Uh, for all panelists, what type of expectations do you have in place for your guards when they're on post? Uh, this is from Heather, or Heaven, I'm sorry, Heaven, by the way, uh, congratulations on your recent uh, move. Uh, let's Let's start with Dave. I'll go. <laughs> so we got two Daves. Um, so what's most important is, is we don't want to um, scare our customers. Uh, we want, uh, they're the first person that they see when they walk in the store, potentially. We want them to smile, be engaging and be helpful for our customer and also be informative and to be able to be the eyes and ears out on our stores to help influence and, and, and provide intel of what's happening in the store. But I'd say most importantly is to be a good ambassador to our brand. That's what's most important. Yeah, I would echo all of that. Um, and we do kind of govern that, I guess, with uh, very specific post orders, um, whether it's off-duty police or uh, contract security agency. Um, we've got pretty, pretty specific expectations around how they'll behave and operate, uh, what I'll say, in peacetime and at other times. So uh, engaging our athletes as they come into the store, being familiar with the store, be able to provide wayfinding. Um, it's just a, another teammate in a different uniform, if you will, uh, until uh, they need to go to go to action. And uh, and still there's there's uh, rules of engagement there, uh, depending on the location and the type of officer that we're deploying, whether off duty police or a security officer. So having those kinds of um post orders in place that are really specific and, and reiterated on a regular basis, I think is pretty important. Yeah, we um, we have post orders too that, that we're pretty strict with um, and it does depend on, on risk level. So um, in some of those extreme stores, we do have the guards doing a little more. They'll respond uh, to a locked cart. They'll respond to an EAS uh, tower. They'll, um, uh, they'll check a receipt uh, in certain locations. Uh, Generally, in the majority uh, of the company, if we have a guard there, they're a deterrent factor. <clears throat> they're there to keep out crime. They're there to keep people safe. <clears throat> they don't really focus as much on the shoplifting piece. They're just a visual deterrent. Um, but again, it depends on, on the stores, uh, on, on how engaged we have that guard. Zach, I'll take the one from um, from Emmeline uh, Taylor. So there's been um, mentioned, this was one of the ones that I wanted to talk about too, when we, um, David, you started off talking about how you go into these neighborhoods and you um, you guys, you know, look at what other stores were doing. And, um, you know, uh, Emmeline's question here, there's been a mention about not displacing crime to other stores. Um, and what examples of collaboration and joining forces uh, do the panel think have been particularly helpful um, besides just, you know, sort of talking shop, but um, you know, obviously you guys have an initiative, David, to go into these stores. 
uh, and uh, actually look around, right? Um, and but I'm assuming you're also in there, you know, talking to people, and, and especially after you open the stores, right? Um, but even before that, you know, you're going in, you're having some discussions. Um, what are some of the opportunities in some of the different communities, um, as far as retail groups and orcas, and you know, all that type of stuff? Yeah, certainly all that, Kevin. I think uh, you know, a big piece of the collaboration is really about consolidating cases. Uh, makes them a easier to prosecute and more appetizing to those prosecutors. Um, so I think that's a that's a big piece of how we collaborate when it comes to kind of not displacing crime and collaborating in that way. Um, it's a little it's a little more difficult, quite frankly, because there's shared expense involved. Um, there's different sensibilities for different companies. Um, you, we may want to put a, a, a live view a technologies tower in one of our parking lots. And it'd be great if the adjacent retailer wanted to share the cost and, and the benefit, by the way. But brokering those relationships is, is not always that easy because that other retailer might not use that technology, might not want to use that technology. Um, we do have pretty great success uh, in shared security officer resources, um, which, is, which has been good for us in some circumstances. Unfortunately, if the officer is shared between two locations, the location that doesn't have the coverage at the time it's being shared is usually at risk. So it, it's problematic in and of itself. But uh, that's where we've had the most experience. Most most of it is is I think I think anybody uh, would say if 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 people have got off duty police or they're using technology in the parking lots or they're doing something special from a, a security or merchandise protection perspective in a store. Um, that if you don't, if you don't you know, kind of meet the minimum standards, you're probably going to be at risk. And at the end of the day, we're all responsible and accountable to our shareholders and our customers. And we want to make sure we're creating that safe environment for them to shop in. Chris? I think uh, David said it perfectly. Um, I mean, collaboration is, is key. And we, I think at the division level, based on the area there's great collaboration uh, i would say at the headquarters we're not reaching out quite as much to the local areas but um, out in each of our divisions there's some great great uh, relationships with other retailers uh, but it's more information sharing than solution sharing um, and, and helping get some of these violent uh, you know offenders out of the stores and, and kind of taking care of each other uh, in the communities by doing that Dave, part of that is is that I think we're all coming together as a community to influence influence legislation, um, our district attorneys uh, on penalties for people that shoplift, and to be able to come together in critical mass that we can influence if we're all together with that same voice and to be able to influence legislation going forward. That's I think the biggest piece that we can tackle going forward in the next several years. Well said. Jack. Okay. Uh, next, let's go to Jeff. Jeff, great hearing from you, guy. Um, Jeff's question is, is it safe for retailers to use facial recognition technology in high-risk stores? I'm going to follow that up with a second question, guys. Um, if you if you look at, obviously, the, the, the final decisions are made by the leaders, okay? But what goes into that decision-making process? Who do you get involved, whether it's the solution provider community, your operations teams. I mean, uh, who all do you get involved when you're making these decisions? And we'll go with the facial recognition as one of those decisions. Yeah, we um, don't have that space, Jack, so I'll defer to the other two if they do. I can, I can go, uh, David. So, you know, we are... Uh, not in a full rollout, but we we do have some technology out there, and you know what? Yeah, the leadership is key, uh, Jack, because I don't think any of us would argue that the value uh, isn't is, isn't tremendous, right? It's it's an amazing value for an asset protection department. It's an amazing value in keeping your customers safe, uh, keeping your associates safe from individuals that have uh, posed threats. Um, so it's amazing technology. Um, so we are also very careful when, when we do uh, use it um, to make sure that we're in an area uh, that, that not only accepts it, but promotes it. There's certain areas of the country uh, where it works very well in, uh, in their, in their uh, 
absolutely used to it in, in most retailers. And, and frankly, it's, it's been a few years and, and many organizations out there have, have taken a risk and laid the foundation and the tracks, I think, for, for all of us to start to use uh, a really great technology out there. Um, I expect it will continue to expand throughout the industry because it is so valuable. Dave, Dave any thoughts on, on that or, or maybe we can expand that too, um, to include what, you know, what are some of, um, what are some of those technologies that we should be investing in, that retailers should be investing in to, um, to help with shrink. I mean, you've got some great stuff there with RFID. You guys have made an investment there for a long time. Um, but whether it be facial recognition, the parking lot cameras, the what, what are you seeing the successes in? The, the license plate readers is, are, are kind of a new thing here. They've had them in Europe and, and I know in the UK um, for, you know, more than a dozen years and they were very successful there. Um, what are some of those those technologies that are helping to cut back on some of the shrink opportunities that we have in the stores. Yeah. And we also have a lot of folks on the, on the call here that are more of the field leaders. And I think that they would be curious to know um, how that decision process is, is carried out. Well, sure. You, you've got to get legal. You've got to get your stakeholders and um, it is a long process to be able to one, get something green lit to be able to provide a proof of concept. What we've seen over time is the technology continues to evolve and get more accurate in regards to face matching. Um, but it is a heavy lift to get started in any type of organization. Um, if you are, have that technology, it fits in with the ecosystem of all the other tools that we have. It's all connected. One is a after the fact, and now you have somebody potentially coming in that you're already aware of and what the history is and understanding how you need to react and uh, predict where exactly they're going to leave the store, et cetera, or what areas that are going to pilfer. Those are the things that give us intel where everything gets connected with all these different technologies, whether it's license plate readers, whether it's uh, face matching, whether it's our smart exits, whether it's any of the other uh, arrows in our quiver, um, we're able to connect all of those and understand where the big opportunities are for ORC and where we're going to spend a lot of our time and resources. So prioritization. Chris, you want to expand on that? Yeah, I'll say, I mean, I, I hit on it a little bit earlier. We have some amazing technology. So, so um, look, if I could do it all, I would um, because it all adds value to an organization. Um, so I would say if you're a retailer, uh, I'll speak on behalf of grocery and, and you're not containing your carts at the door, um, then, then you're probably missing a valuable resource. So you're not monitoring, uh, your, your self checkouts. You're probably missing a valuable solution there. Um, but they're all, they're all extremely valuable solutions. Um, you just have to do what's right for you. Um, there is, there is some saturation where, where if you do too many of them, um, that, that some of the value might be diminished on, on each individual one. So choose them carefully. If you have a leadership team that, that buys into one over another and is passionate about one, use that momentum uh, and, and, and invest in it uh, because you're, you're going to get a return. Mr. Lund, any thoughts on, uh, on the technologies out there that are helping you guys to reduce the impact of shrink in your stores? So, yeah, so we are, uh, the smart exit uh, that Macy's is using is something we'll be deploying in the next 30 days. Uh, pretty excited about that and what it'll teach us. Um, and uh, and the, the face matching technology is very interesting to us. Um, and it's something that we explored years and years ago, pre-COVID, um, and with some limited success. Um, but uh, it's really, uh, tenuous as far as, you know, where you deploy that kind of technology because there are specific state and even municipal laws uh, for or against it. Um, and those seem to be changing pretty quickly. So it's a difficult investment to make uh, when um, when A, public sentiment might, might not be great for it and B, it might become illegal after you've uh, installed it. So um, something that, you know, we've just been paying attention to uh, before we deploy something like that. 
but certainly like it's been mentioned, uh, getting all of our operations partners involved, the legal department, you know, it's really very important that everybody's kind of locked arms and working together toward uh, keeping stores safe using technology. Excellent. Jack, you have a favorite here you want to pull? Uh, let's see. What what are some of the more prominent changes? If you look, I mean, you guys have all been around a long time. When you when you look at at the changes in the way that we address things and uh, the high shrink issues in the stores from the time that you started in the industry until now, what do you think some of the bigger uh, advancements that we've made are? You know. For me, everything's just kind of just a better mousetrap, if you will. Like, I don't know, aside from, you know, the the face and feature matching technology out there, that everything else is just a little bit better than, you know, technology we've always had. Even Smart Exit is using RFID and EAS technology that's been there for a long, long time. I think the real unlock is what Chris and Kroger is doing and where we hope to get uh, is that interconnectivity of technologies. Like, that's the game changer. That's what really makes a difference is when you can pull all these different technologies together, talking to one another um, and interacting with one another so they can tell a complete story and and uh, build evidence. It's hard to uh, rebut is I think uh, I think that's really important. And of course, the analytics that we have today and AI technology that's emerging in our space uh, is going to be fun, fun to watch. I mean, we can do the same kinds of data digging that we've always done. We just do it a lot faster and we're a lot smarter about it. But again, it's just a newer mousetrap. It's that interconnectivity of all of it that's really the game changer, in my opinion. You know, I, could, I can maybe uh, go a little different direction with it. <clears throat> and, you know, when I started, um, you know, there, there was a few buckets of shrink. Uh, and I think where we are today, uh, and, and David Rogers hit on it a little bit, there's so many operational causes of shrink that we know today. <clears throat> um, we could fill up 100% of our time going after operational shrink. Uh, and then if you look at, in the grocery world, you know, you know, we talked about markdowns, but what are you doing with your uh, conditioning of your produce? Are you cutting the ends off and soaking it at night to, to replenish shit and keep it fresh? That way it doesn't go bad quicker. Are you spraying your berries? Are you keeping your asparagus in water? Are you giving your meat uh, an eighth or a quarter inch of fat? I mean, there's a million things we could do. How many chickens we're producing versus how many we're selling and how many we're going to and how we're going to second chance that if we don't sell them. I mean, we could we could be in there all day after operations. So uh, what we know today seems to be a lot greater, at least than what I knew when I started. Um, and balancing those priorities is, is often difficult. I'd say the biggest change from I've seen in an evolution is just getting down to the UPC level and understanding specifically when and how and what is going out your store versus guessing on a yearly annual inventory and saying, wow, I didn't realize we're having, I got surprised by the shortage in this particular category of goods. Here you have something every day being able to tell you how you're doing, where you need to react. And our agility is so much better than it's ever been. And we're more efficient uh, for it. It's funny. It's one of those things too, where, you know, when you look back, um, and we've all been in this industry for a long time. So um, it, I think it's, uh, you know, a, a fair analysis that it's kind of like looking back when, you know, when I had a pager, um, when we used a fax machine, right? Um, when we had, um, you know, the cell phones that were in a suitcase, you know, that are, you know, and now we've got microcomputers in our back pocket, you know, um, it, and, and you look back and like, how did we survive? You know, like, how did we do it back then? Like, if you think about the inventory process 20 years ago, and it's like, how, so much that we just, we didn't know, you know, that now we can tell almost daily, right? It's, uh, it's amazing. Don't, don't forget reviewing journal tape against the VHS recording. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, how many people are saying, what's journal tape? Yeah, yeah. yeah too. Yeah, well, and what's VHS is kind yeah. of... <laughs> <laughs> the other one right <clears throat> too funny um there's a couple of questions in here guys um that are specific to there's one for chris um dave there's one for you do you guys want to go in and you could type a response in there um 
I think uh, I, uh, that might be uh, that might be helpful um, for uh, let's see. Um, so Zafar had a question about uh, external events, unrest, protests as catalysts for increased risk within the stores um, that you've already dubbed as extreme or high risk. So, uh, and, and how do you how do you respond? Is that um, do you see other things that are impacting your high risk store analysis outside of the inventory process, like events that take place, and now all of a sudden this has become a high risk store? Um, or is it mostly based on the, you know, the inventory process? Um, and Chris, I'll start with you. Yeah, we haven't used anything like a civil unrest to change our, our risk level. Um, like I said, the very first component is, is uh, the historical information from crime, crime index scores. Um, but um, I would say if, if it was habitual, and we saw a lot of it, we, we, uh, we certainly would maybe have a separate list for that store. Um, it's, a, it's a fair call out though, but we're, we're just not today, we're not adjusting it. Dave Rogers. We have a lot of different metrics that we look at. We have a long history. We have our own um, operation center that logs everything. So we have all that internal data and uh, various different protest events that have occurred. And we have made adjustments based upon our own data. We always look at crime de index as well, but we find our own data um, to be the primary driving force behind what we do. And um, whether it's adding polycarbonate glass on reinforcing our stores, exteriors, um, we have a better comfort level in those locations that we've deemed high risk than we've ever had. That's great. Mr. Lund? Yeah, for us, it's incident based. Um, I don't think we've ever changed our, our risk rating for a store because of an event or even a series of events in a short period of time. Um, and uh, even when we were experiencing a little bit more civil unrest, a lot of that would happen in stores that would in areas where we had stores that we would not have considered high risk at all, or at least we didn't have those experiences, but they were for the moment. So where we deploy board up procedures or off duty police or something like that, it was always very temporary. Um, one more I'm going to throw out there um, from Miriam when we talk about um, training and preparation for employees. Um, I think this is obviously this is one that hits home for me, um, but it also I think um, is is pretty important because we can't do this alone, right? Um, so how are you guys engaging your associate base, um, David? Your you know your teammate base. Um, how are we getting them engaged in this process and how are we making sure that they're aware of the operational opportunities um, and deficiencies and, and, and things that can happen? The um, direct store deliveries, you know, Chris, from, from that perspective, you know, how are they um, knowing to, what to look for and, and what to watch out for um, and just overall getting them engaged in this, this shrink control process? Uh, Dave Rogers, let's start with you today. You know, part of our store's shortage reduction strategy, where we're tailoring it to that specific store based upon their resources, their ideas, their partnerships and changes in process, because it could change uh, operational shortage that's fueling it. What's important is, is that everybody understands what their role is, where and why uh, we're going after things, whether it's the person that's unboxing something and applying AAS tags on in a step out way, in an exception way, where we're, we're going to stand harder in regards to what we do on this particular category of goods to the person that's placing the merchandise in a certain way or cabling it to a fixture, to a sales manager who's making the rounds throughout the day and understanding, wow, I understand what the protection is on this category of goods. And I know why, because we continue to reinforce it at our shortage reduction meetings with our AP leadership and as a company that we know we have to win in these categories of goods. So everybody has to play a role in that um, uh, cycle in regards to where the merchandise comes off the truck to the moment it goes out our customers, uh, out with our customer in a shopping bag. Excellent. David Lund? Yeah, so uh, while well, I'll say, and maybe I'm old school, that, uh, you know, poster programs and table talkers and even, you know, computer-based training back in the office all still have a place. Um, although I'll tell you, it's a very small place comparatively anymore um, today, it's all about getting that information to our teammates in a more digital fashion and on a handheld whenever we possibly can. And uh, it's just uh, whether it's huddle notes about what's going on in the store for the day, 
um, you know, be on the lookout type information or just basic awareness and training in very quick, like micro trainings, if you will, uh, that uh, that can be uh, fun um, is uh, is pretty important. But I, I still think some of those old school platforms still have a space. Uh, but I think the the more digital and the more mobile we can get uh, with our awareness and training to keep our teammates informed uh, is better. And I think they like it better, too. Yeah, well, and and you create a connected campaign, right? Like you you want that digital stuff to connect with the stuff that they're seeing, you know, peripherally, whether it be the poster on the wall, the the tabletop or in the break room table or the decal on the floor or something on their lockers or that type of thing. Um, Chris? Yeah, the only thing I would add, and, and great comments from, from the other panelists, is uh, we, we do a lot of um, in the field training. So we do something called Shrink University every year. Uh, we send a couple of our folks out there to do training in a division for the division AP leadership. We do an annual DSD refresh that starts with the division leadership and then trickles down into the D, uh, DSD associates and that, that run the back of the stores. Uh, and we'll do periodic uh, uh, standard walks, well, I should say quarterly standard walks, uh, where if there's a new initiative and there's standards that we walk through the store which, uh, with the associates and with the managers, uh, we do a training there. So like I said about chickens, there one, one month it might be, oh, this is the standards walk on the process for your ordering, for your second chancing, for your, how long your chickens can stay out there. Um, so, we, so we do a lot of in-person uh, education like that too. Excellent. Jack, what do you think? You got, uh, you got one more up your sleeve? Well, I got one more. Let's, let's talk about... Um... You know, there's been a lot of discussion on this in general. And what do you feel today is having the the largest impact on shrink, whether it's a positive impact or a negative impact? Let's let's just end with with a more general question like that. All right, let's start with uh, Mr. Lund. So uh, I'll keep it positive and it's all about the people and uh, they just want to know how they can help. And, um, and sometimes they want to help um, more uh, and keeping them safe and understanding limitations and understanding that people are the most important thing in our stores, whether it's our, our teammates or our athletes is, uh, is, is paramount. So I think the biggest positive difference that we can make and that we have made is, uh, is keeping our teammates informed so they can support our athletes best and, uh, and keep each other safe. I'll say it. Mr. Rogers. I'd say that the training that we put in in regards to de-escalation, uh, trying to avoid issues early before they become bigger issues, um, having drills uh, and infrastructure built within our stores for assembly areas. If we have an active shooter in any of our locations, the commitment to our colleagues well-being with total AP uh, well-being sessions with professional counselors um, that we did several sessions over the summer with. Um, those are some of the things that I don't know if we would have done that six or seven years ago, but we are doing today and it's making the difference for our colleagues and it's making them feel safe. It's always people over product every time. Excellent. Chris, you want to wrap it up? Yeah, um, I think the big wins are, are one solutions and technology and data. Um, we have great solutions that we've never had before. We have data that we've never had before. Uh, and that certainly empowers us to make the right decisions to protect the product and the people. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges in this time, and, and I'm not alone here, is the digital marketplace. The ability to, to transfer uh, stolen goods to cash is, is easier uh, now than ever. And I know we have some, some, uh, some laws out there that, that are still young, uh, but we'll be curbing that. Um, but that, that's really uh, when, when we make it extremely easy to convert stolen goods to cash that that's when we start to see this uptick well said all right well i want to thank you guys for um uh participating with us today we, you know you guys this was a i didn't know if we were going to fill the time today and we actually we got to that 90 minutes and I, I still feel like we could keep going so um, thank you guys very much for participating today and for uh, sharing your thoughts and your your experiences and your best practices. We appreciate that. We appreciate our sponsors, uh, Genetech, Cap Index, LVT, and Salient Systems. Again, please show these guys some love and uh, and please um, 
learn a little bit more about what they do. Uh, you might not need them today, but you you might need them tomorrow. We heard about a couple of them today, actually, as well. So um, definitely worth worth checking out. And thank you again to those sponsors. Thank you to the LPF, uh, LostPreventionFoundation.org. Again, keep track of this. You get your three CEU credits if you are already certified. And if you're not, then you should be getting certified. There is your QR code to, I promised in the beginning, I'd show it again. And there it is. I'm showing it again. Just get your phone out, scan it. If you're not already subscribed, make sure you're subscribing right now because right now it's free. Uh, those scholarships are available. If you need to email me and let me know uh, that you've got some law enforcement folks in your community or um, in your region, your district, you know, if there's folks that you network with from through the ORCAs, um, we've got some great ORC training and, and uh, responding to retail theft opportunities here with um, education for these patrol officers. We've got a detective level course coming. We've got a DA level course coming. Um, ben, these are you know free to the law enforcement community right now. We've got some scholarships available. So please do reach out. We're happy to share uh, and get them links to that information. And uh, I, with that, I will wrap it up and say thank you, everybody. Uh, stay safe. Jack, any parting words? Uh just great job, everyone. Great questions, great answers. I love it that we left it on a positive note. Loving it. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much. Uh, appreciate your time today. Thank you to the sponsors. Thank you to you for attending. Uh, we appreciate you as well. And we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Stay safe.